Stanton, my head's been trending a direction and it's um I've I've gotten to a point in my work in schools and with kids and with parents and teachers who are concerned, who are anxious, who feel like things are really uncertain right now and are aren't sure where aren't sure which direction they should be headed. And so I want to discuss that today and a lot of the issues that I want to discuss center on social media and the way that kids or younger people are finding enjoyment and the differences between enjoyment and an over-involvement and then the way that adults are connecting or aren't with kids given that due to social media due to gaming due to just new ways of either escaping or finding fulfillment in a thing in short order there's a generational gap along with and i'm talking about in schools along with the cultural divide a way that people aren't compatible when they're talking along with just a total difference in mindsets in some circumstances so the problem i'm trying to solve or at least name adequately is how do teachers parents how to concern people work with kids not just so that they feel comfortable and good in the here and now yeah that's good if you can get it but also so that you can raise or help raise or help facilitate the growth and development of a child into a healthy adult. And we've talked about this before. I have a couple things that I'm going to just put out now and then we'll come back to them. My colleague is a she's a teacher in her elementary school. She's a second grade teacher and she's one of the smartest people I've ever met. And she's smart in that way that I don't know, the way that you think about addiction, right? That's almost like there's uh, the irrationality, there's the regular narrative. There are people who kind of know the narrative isn't right, but don't know what to do with that information. And then there are some people like you who cut through it all and say, come on, this is reality. And so let's just admit it. And she's that kind of person. And it's hard, I think, to be that kind of person working in a public school. It's kind of like you working in an addiction treatment space or something. She calls this um, kids' involvements with phones, games, social media, and with each other through those things, she calls it a fourth dimension of tech space. <laughs> Whereas the kids come to her classroom and she's expected to teach them a certain thing in the, th in the three dimensions that we know, yet their minds are fixated, preoccupied, with this fourth dimension of tech space. And she doesn't think that the tech space is necessarily bad. She just doesn't understand it. And the questions that she's been asking me, sometimes rhetorically, sometimes for advice, are how can I better understand it so that I know what to do with it? Uh, so I guess the, the big question for her is, I don't think she would put it in these terms, but here's how I think about it with respect to our life process program and the work we do in the addiction field. She's kind of saying, what is this thing, this culture, this way of communicating, this way of being that my students have that I'm not understanding? How can I let them feel comfortable talking about it, doing it so that I can better understand it and they can know that I'm someone who wants to understand? How much of it should I allow in my classroom or like what aspects of it? What what are people allowed to even pull from the lexicon of that space and bring to my classroom? And what is what part of it is uh, could be destructive in terms of development? And then once I have that, what the heck do I do with that information? So that's what I, I want to consider. I'm going to put a placeholder there. So that she's kind of talking about harm reduction, and then also how to sense, help people naturally through the course of their development and how to weave the expectations of our current legacy system of schools with the ideas and motivations that kids come in with. So I'll pause there because I think it's worth reflecting that we've talked a little bit about some of this already. We, You brought up to me the book by Andrea Elliott, The Invisible Child. We were talking, she talked in that book or wrote in that book about homeless American children. And it was in the in the millions who are basically forgotten about 
I mean, they're unseen, and except for, as she calls it, an alphabet soup of agencies who are tasked with you know, saving kids or people in poverty, but who actually kind of mess up the family system. Uh, they're in place ostensibly to help, but the, the help doesn't match this version of culture that these kids or families are accustomed to. They're not talking. So it kind of reminds me of this issue. Well, Andrea Elliott's saying there's a regular normal universe and attached to it is a quite large alternative universe. Right. Which we ignore. Right. Your colleague is saying, well, something similar, but the normal universe is like middle-aged or whatever you are, adults. Mm -hmm. And then there's a new whole generation of young people. And so she's saying you can't avoid it. Other people are saying you can't avoid being aware of this because it's affecting fundamentally everyone at a certain age group. And if you're in a school system, you're gonna have, you have to deal with them. That's what she's saying. Right. And if you're in it. My colleague's saying that, and Andrew, Andrew Elliott's sort of saying that too. It's like there's not right in the in the in the universe we're part of the you know a, a majority, a middle class kind of a culture. Th there's no place for the values, for the expectations, the motivations, the set of skills, the ways of just navigating the world that they have in impoverished communities. And she wrote about ways in which. You know, we talked about a crack epidemic and then funny enough, in some ways, crack is what preserved the integrity of what culture they had in their communities and in impoverished communities. And so we discussed that. And um, then on the other side of things, there is uh, another kind of a children's mental health crisis. And that's like the, the more affluent kids or just any old kid, I guess where we you call this episode Munchausen syndrome by proxy where parents and then so by default also people tasked with re helping rear their kids or rendering them competent so to speak teachers and and mental health professionals but most but really parents are so concerned about the immediate safety of their kids like ensuring a certain safety and comfort that they're not able to that they, they want to allow for those things but that's to the detriment of allowing their kids to do things like in lenore skenazy the author's case let their kids ride a subway when they're young or play they without soup the immersion of the kids in whatever the tech is the tech universe that your colleague describes an alternative universe where they don't leave the house sort of, and they're dealing with iPhones and games and all what you say. Right. So this parents are thrilled with the fact that, oh, look, and this is like what Lenore Skenazy, if people don't know, Lenore Skenazy wrote the book, Free Range Kids, and she has uh, uh, letgrow.org as her website. And she talks about, you know, we're, they're helicopter parents and there, there are ways that we're not letting kids explore enough and, and they should be more exploratory and making more connections and doing more things on their own independently. And, and when she talked to me, even she's kind of said, lauding the fact that, well, the kids aren't having sex as often. Well, they're not doing drugs as often. So isn't that like good for like the addiction field? And I'm thinking, no, this is it's not good for the same reason you're saying it's not good. Parents are parents are okay for some reason. No, well, maybe I shouldn't say it that way. As long as those numbers are down, oh, there's there's less. Um, they're doing drugs less. They're drinking less. They're having sex less often. Despite the fact that mental health conditions, depression, anxiety is increasing in record numbers right now. And it's pretty clear to see 
that the lack of experience in childhood due to the the focus on safety and comfort and not getting into any risk in the short term, even medium sized risks that and people maybe used to interactions with the world right. and other people. There's got to be there's a downside to that. And you just sent me a, a article on the Atlantic and there's like 400 points this author makes. It was a very well written article and I'll link to it because I can't remember the, the name of it. But it one of the points she made was, well, in the, all the raising, all the, all the higher rates of anxiety and depression, uh, the good news is there we can figure out who's going to become depressed and anxious. And if we can find that they're depressed and anxious, they have medications for them. Well, it, it, that she and then she goes on to say the problem is despite these medications people are still people even more record numbers uh are depressed and anxious so it can't be well let's just like pull back on the whole experiencing the world and people kind of a thing or taking any risks or figuring things out independently let's pull back on that for our kids that way they're safe and comfortable and i mean if they're going to get depressed or anxious that we can just medicate them. Sorry, that's not working either. So the there's a problem. And so the the solution to that problem is going to have to be some version of asking the question at least or proposing some ideas about how kids can have real life experiences in this world so they can grow independence and they can become less dependent on things that distract them or give them some source of of uh, gratification only in the short term. That is what my colleague is worried about when it comes to technology. Now, my colleague specifically said something about what should I permit in the classroom and what should I not permit. Yeah, she's Can trying to that old she, therapy trick where you sort of look smart. And you say something like, well, what sorts of things do you find to be more constructive and less constructive? Because she's dealing with it on a minute by minute basis. Well, I'm even an easier, uh, my therapy job with her is even easier. Sometimes she'll say, hey, see the office door open and say, can I do a Zach therapy session? She actually, that's how she puts it. And re- she, all she needs is to talk it out. So like on the I'm the motivational interviewing guy that just says, hey, lay it on me. And then she talks it out or works it out. I'd have to say very little. And she was saying that, that. The one thing she's interested in, uh, there there are a lot. One thing that she is interested in is what kinds of skills do kids need to have in order to do these things that they're doing effectively? I mean, she just wants to understand. She's like, I'm 40 something, whatever she is. I'm not on TikTok. I'm not playing video games. I'm not, I don't know. And I know that she, she's saying still, I know a lot of people look at that as just like a passive worthless activity, but you know, you have to be at least competent enough. Let's do a scale. I mean, you have to be able to turn the thing on. I don't know if that's a skill, but you know that that's more than no skill. You have to be able to interact with the, the interface. You have to know how to scroll or what to look for. And there's some social element to it where you understand that there are people creating things. So like, what could I pull on from that? I would have to understand it first. And she sometimes kids will say stuff like that involve the word kill or that will have an inappropriate, it's, it's some inappropriate kind of language. And I think that's the thing that she started. I think that's when she started becoming so involved in thinking about this is that are people using words in the class that seem that would actually seem perfectly okay in this culture of what she calls the fourth dimension of tech space <laughs> for kids. And they wouldn't know otherwise that that wouldn't be acceptable here. And then she takes one extra step. Is there some, is there either, either is there some reason that I have a priori of saying that's just not good or maybe it is not good. And I need to help them invite them in to this world a little more to see how they're compatible. I think that's an interesting. Can she make that the same way I'm suggesting, and you already have figured out to make that a topic of your therapy session. <laughs> can she make that a topic for class discussion? Yeah. Can she say, um, well, 
what are the things that you do that people will pay you to do? Yeah. Which is, I always, you know, like the, you want to graduate and be able to, you know, buy a house and feed your family. And then maybe she could just express what she expresses to you. I'm nervous about using the word kill or whatever slang they're using. Uh, am I wrong? Or can you just see where I'm coming? You know what I mean? Throw that out to the group. Yeah. Or at least make them sensitized to that. Stuff. I agree with that. Um, and, you know, if anyone can do that with a room full, I'm pretty good one-on-one -on -one and with small groups of kids or talking with their families, helping them navigate. If anyone could have that conversation with an entire room full of kids and have them get engaged in the conversation is this woman, I'm telling you. Um, but I, I like that there's another part that she's thinking about, which is what should I do to become just more familiar with this on my own so that I can see like what the space is that they're occupying or what they're doing on here. So she's taking it upon herself to get on social media platforms and just sort of test it out and see what the function is. And I think that's so interesting to have. Uh, and so I think there does have to be, uh, and maybe there will be, or there already is some way that staff in schools are going to have to learn about social media. I said to our, uh, sorry, I'm taking up, eating up the stage. So just one more thing. I said to our business partner in Ireland, when we, when he asked me to start putting the, program out there and getting eyes on it i said we should uh start a tiktok channel and he laughed at me he said that's like what 13 year olds are using and uh that channel has become ubiquitous not only among 13 year old kids but adults use it now and it's a way of getting information across and she's thinking the same way is there any way you can um say to your colleague you know i really welcome these discussions we're having it's very educational to me you're very systematic. Is there any way that you can distill from our conversation? Can you develop a curriculum that addresses what you've come to me for help for? Right. Can it's almost like saying, could you just answer your own problem and start teaching it? But it's in a different way. <laughs> uh, what would the 10 sessions or 20 sessions right. be? You know, I, I mean, one would be vocabulary. One would be different perspectives based on your age. I don't know what they'd all be. One would be TikTok versus uh, Facebook. Um, you know, uh, one would be pro-social versus anti-social. Based on this, can you develop a 10 or 20 session curriculum? I, it would be titled something like how to make social media how to integrate social media into the educational process. <laughs> yeah, that's a good that's a good suggestion. Yeah, I bet and I bet she would go for it. She's one I of those you No, know, one little story. Um I, I, in Brooklyn, I actually lived uh, you you're in my newer place. You didn't see my old place. I lived in a back house. And the guy in the front house developed the mechanics of applications for cell phones. And he made money. And, you know, they could afford to live in Brooklyn. And then he got fired. And uh, he was a little worried. He had a wife and a child. And she didn't work. And then out of the blue, this is sort of like a magic story. Columbia University, um, Stanford University Medical School contacted him because they have all these apps now where you operate on a person but you need to visualize what you're doing. Somebody mm. needs to make that connection. And somehow they decided that he was it. And then when you're Stanford Medical School, price is no object. You know what I mean? So they said, well, why don't you move to Palo Alto? And uh, I, they actually said San Jose. And uh, he said, well, isn't that expensive? And they said, well, don't worry about that. And then he says, well, my wife is very close to her brother. And, uh, you know, he might have to move to Palo Alto, too. And they said, we can, we can deal with that, too. Mm. Yes. 
so here's a guy who was making applications for cell phones, um, making a living, and all of a sudden, those skills became the center of kind of one of the most important universes. Everybody's worried, you know, if they're going to go in and get a heart a transplant, that they have a machine that knows can really focus on that. So that's an example of where, in some ways, you know, playing game, I'm not saying playing games is like, well, productive, but I'm not, it's the last thing I'm saying, but it certainly can lead in that direction. And there's creative directions you can take it towards. There is, um, I guess, to make this useful and valuable for people beyond the anecdote, uh, um, I think I, I talked to Peter Gray pretty recently. You know, he's all about, do you know who I'm talking about? The psychologist. And there's some things he says that are like, he's drunk a little too much of the let's be radical Kool-Aid, I think, but maybe not. I don't know. But he talks about play. People find use in play. Adults do it too. It's because they feel comfortable enough to have discussions, do things that they otherwise would feel like there's a ceiling on their ability to do. Then when they do, when they go past it, they either get corrected or figure out, well, this is a really useful thing I'm doing. Schools aren't play-based now. So that's already a problem. Schools are very much curriculum driven, focused. Listen to this. I'm a sage on a stage and I'm going to give you this curriculum. And if you can um, wrap your head around it, you're a good student. If you can't wrap your head around it, we're going to evaluate you to figure out what's wrong with you. Um, so I think but beyond your... Um, beyond your suggestion for this colleague to say, well, let's figure out a almost like a curriculum kind of discussion we could have, not just let's test it out. We'll do the um, prototype in my class and then we can expand it. You're kind of expressing what I'm trying to do in the school right now. Or there might be a, there might be a way to include this concept that people are already kind of familiar with that kids are, are just too... How are you asking people to sit in the seat for 80 minutes, you know, when they're in second grade? So I, I can imagine this being something. And you're right. There are going to be skills to tap into. That you could say this actually, this skill, maybe not on TikTok per se, maps onto career stuff that you could do. So you want to break down the wall. You're saying, Peter Gray, I, I think I've heard him say this. I'm going to tell a story out of school about Peter Gray. <laughs> I know somebody who knows him. And Peter Gray said, there's a story I'm going to tell you, but I don't want you to tell anybody. I let my son go to England by himself when he was 12. <laughs> In other words, that's out Peter Gray and Peter Gray. You know what I mean? Right, right. <laughs> that is out, but... That right. <laughs> so he's sort of like, that's too radical for Dieter Gray radicals. But he's <laughs> saying, let's break down the barrier between play and that. Who made up that play education thing anyhow? You know, where did that come in? And where has it become dysfunctional? Or where can the play thing, I mean, play is thinking up new things with your imagination that engage people that can be fun and useful, you know, let's have a play session around uh, whatever. Let's identify a topic that's useful, you know? Now you're on the, you're like on a, in a useful mindset track. And so let me bring you down a little bit. No, you're, you're awfully optimistic, which I think we need to be in, in just thinking and being creative. Let me just spend a second before we end on some of the consequences I've seen of not understanding this space that kids are occupying the way that this teacher is concerned about. Well, when somebody does, in gaming, kill means, it can mean, like my character was killed. In other words, I lost this round. I was killed. It's a, it's, you know, it's a euphemism for like I lost the thing. And, but I get another, it, it, even in that schema, it means I lost a round, but I get another one. So I got and killed. I'm going to start again. Psychology that says you don't want to become inured 
to seeing something getting killed. That's a bad way to go. Well, no, that's not even what I'm thinking. What I'm thinking is that the school's response to a child, I see what you mean, but the school's response to a child uttering killed, I'm going to get killed, uh, killed something, is suspension. You suspend it, you know, and I try, I'm, I'm the behavior person at my school, so I have, I can pull a few strings most times where you don't suspend a kid. But the consequences of not understanding what a kid's saying is rather than it being a learning experience, like, oh, in your video game, you say this and it means this in a classroom or a restaurant or, a, you know, wherever you go to work, you're going to say kill. People might not get that. Let's think of a different, you know, alternative way of expressing this. And that's a teaching. That's almost like a literacy moment for that kid. So and there it, are consequences. Say, even, isn't your colleague teacher saying, well, I've got to learn to hear kill differently. You know what she, I mean? She's saying that. She's saying I need to learn to at least understand so that if there's something that's not pro-social or applicable in some contexts, I still get to be, I'm not, you know, I'm not that out of sorts i still know what's going on in this world and i can help kids but at least i can know where they're coming from in order to lead them she's unique she's way too much like me by the way she's like i had to learn that she is like this radical thinker and she she's quietly radical but she fits in to the school system and so i've kind of teased her that you know i'm taking this step i hate pbis and that's i'm doing it i, I pulled her into the committee that's how i know so much about her now and uh, I said, well, I'm doing that leadership thing, but you got to do something now with your weird radical ideas. And so maybe there'll be two people on a leadership team somewhere. <laughs> well, after we uh, shut up this, we're coming down to our discussion. Mm. I don't know how to put this the right way. There's a market for what she's doing. Yeah. She didn't just come up one morning and say, oh, I discovered this. Yeah. Productive thinking in that direction can be profitable. Just man, she's she's addressing a problem that I think people maybe she's the she articulates it better than other people could put it, but people are still aware it's a problem. Yeah, that's why there's a market for it, and maybe she's just a little bit more brave than other people. Maybe she will take a step in trying to solve something. But that's the message of today. Let's just think about be, that for the future, yeah. Sure. So beyond the, um, you know, just trying to explore this the this whole area of child development and trying to help kids experience the world. And so what's our place and what's not our place? How are we making things better or worse? Um, there's a pitch to people who feel like if you understand a concept like this really well, and I'm trying to take my own advice, um, they're right. That's marketable. Talk about tapping into skills. Maybe reach in, tap into your own skills, and put it out there. People will bite, as as we've noticed in our program. Well, that's a great area to think in, Zach. Let's call it a day and uh, think some more about it. We'll call it and change the world tomorrow. Happy Sunday. Happy Sunday. <laughs>